G'day and welcome to Redriven and welcome to part five of our top five iconic cars that you can actually afford to go and buy. And guys, guess what? This is the final part of the series. Now, if you haven't seen parts one through to four, you might want to hit that pause button now and go and check out the videos. The link's just up there. A, because in part one we explain the rules, and B, because a few of the cars that you guys are suggesting we've actually already mentioned in previous episodes. So before you go suggesting any cars, go and watch parts one through to four. Now, for the rest of us that have seen the previous episodes, thank you so much for sticking with this series. But the thing is, the more we researched these lists, the more cars popped up that we could have included. So if we've missed some cars that you would have loved to have seen, we're really sorry. Anyway, look, it's the same rules as before. Iconic doesn't necessarily have to mean good or fast or anything like that. These cars have to be as internationally and as readily available as possible. And again, we've tried to stick to under 150,000 Aussie dollars to keep them somewhat affordable. And also, even though this list is in numerical order, look, just to ignore that, all of these cars right across the series are all iconic in their own special way. There is no winner. They're all great. Actually, some of them have been a little bit shit, but you know what I mean. Anyway, kicking things off this week, it's the Honda Civic. Launched in the early 1970s, the Civic propelled Honda into becoming a truly global car company, quickly becoming the right car at the right time, time and time again. Before the Civic, Honda was most famous for its motorcycles, but the arrival of the Civic saw Honda's cars grab an equal share of attention. And if it went for the Civic and its influence on both Honda and the car industry in general, the company itself may not have gone on to the success that it now sees. While the first generation Civic initially grabbed headlines thanks to its powerful and smooth, yet extremely economical engine, it was environmentally conscious right from the start, being the only car that could pass the ultra strict Clean Air Act without the need for an exhaust catalyst. From then, the Civic constantly evolved and improved over 11 generations, offering buyers everything from efficiency-focused daily runabouts to giant-slaying serious performance variants wearing the arguably equally as iconic Type R badge. No matter what the generation, model, or variant, for 50 years, the Civic has always offered class-leading depths of engineering expertise, reliability, and efficiency. Seen in more recent times as Japan's Volkswagen Golf, the Civic has become an integral part of the hatchback and compact to medium car category category and consistently pushes what is expected from this genre of vehicle forward. And with Honda selling in excess of 20 million Civics over its lifespan, there are plenty to choose from on the used market. Here in Australia, as little as $3,000 will get you into say a 2000 to 2005 base model Civic sedan with well over 250,000 kilometers on the clock. And at the other end of the spectrum, you're going to be looking at around about $65,000 for a current gen 2019 or 2020 Type R or maybe a sublime F D2 Civic Type R in near perfect condition. Now this next car is uh, a bit controversial for us because at the moment it is our highest watched video but at the same time we really upset some fans of this car. It's the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. Think of any innovation in safety or comfort and it likely started with the S-Class. From its inception way back in 1972, even though Mercedes had been producing previous S-Class associated large luxury sedans from the 1950s, Mercedes-Benz's flagship car has always set the industry standard in luxury cars, becoming and remaining the default transport for CEOs, world leaders, and those trying to impress when selecting a higher car. The impact of the S-Class on the world of motoring is substantial with the safety and technology featured in each generation of S-Class trickling down to the cars that the rest of us actually drive. The S-Class was the first car in Europe to incorporate airbags. It was one of the first cars to feature active safety and accident avoidance technology, plus forged the way for a holistic approach to safety, integrating both active and passive safety features. The S-Class and its predecessors included crumple zones, a collapsible steering column, and strengthened occupant cells from as early as the 1950s. It introduced ABS in 1978 and traction control and electronic stability programs from 1995. Look, it's all equipment that we take for granted these days, but it was the S-Class that popularized these life-saving features, all while retaining its legendary status around the world as the ultimate luxury sedan, incorporating creature comforts and levels of technology other manufacturers copy and imitate time and time again. This is why the S-Class is iconic. Getting behind the wheel, or maybe into the back seat these days, here in Australia is going to set you back anywhere from around about five thousand dollars but remember the world's most expensive car is a cheap Mercedes while at the other end of the spectrum and obviously far from affordable for the majority of us here in Australia three hundred and seventy to four hundred thousand dollars will land you in a barely used 2021 s5 ADL what you'll get for the upper end of our affordable criteria the slightly loose one hundred and fifty thousand dollar budget you're going to be
be looking at everything from a 2014 AMG S63 to 2018 S350 and 400Ds. And if you want to know why so many S-Class fans got upset at us, just click on this link just up here. Like the S-Class is iconic, but just remember, it's not sometimes all that it seems. Okay, next up, it's another German, but this time it's far smaller and far more affordable. It's the Volkswagen Golf. The Golf isn't just iconic. Time and time again, it has been described as a phenomenon. Regardless of which generation, of which there have been eight over the last 48 years, this motoring icon defies all automotive and social class distinctions. It can be argued that no other car of this size or segment has ever come close to reaching as large a cross-section of people from such a variety of different financial means as the Golf. Before the Golf, or as the North American market originally called it, the Rabbit, appeared back in 1974, hatchbacks, they did exist, but they weren't anywhere near as popular then as they have been since the Golf came along. Not only was the first Golf affordable, practical and efficient, unlike many consumer-focused cars from older decades, the Mark I Golf still looks fantastic. It's genuinely stylish, especially in GTI trim, and it's easy to see why the design became and is still so loved. It has become as iconic to newer generations as the Beetle was to their grandparents. And with Volkswagen claiming to have sold a Golf every 41 seconds around the globe, it has become the second highest selling car of all time, shifting in excess of 35 million examples. There has been, and to an extent, still is a Golf to suit everyone's tastes. For those wanting performance, take your pick at the various GTI and R models. For those wanting adventure, grab an all track. For those wanting efficiency, check out the GTE at least in the markets where it's actually available. But no matter which Golf, they have all, in one way or another, been very close to the perfect car for almost every scenario. As long as you ignore the fact that no one really liked the Mark III all that much, and the fact that the Golf was instrumental in the whole Dieselgate scandal, and there are quite a few reliability issues here and there, but besides all that, they're a, they're a great thing. Getting into a Golf here in Australia is gonna start at around about $3,000. But that is gonna be some clapped out old Mark IV that is probably minutes away from being turned into scrap metal. And at the other end of the spectrum, seventy dollars to $75,000 will get you behind the wheel of say a 2020 Golf R Final Edition. Or for about thirty dollars or $40,000, you could get yourself into a very nice Golf GTI, like the one we reviewed just up in this video here. Okay, look, next up it's a tough one because technically it's two cars and they're they're very similar, but at the same time, they're not. It's the Mazda RX-3 and RX-7. While the RX-7 might be the highest selling rotary powered car of all time, and was decisive in the future of Mazda, and obviously deserves an iconic status, it's the RX-3 that actually introduced rotary engines to the world. Where NSU and Mercedes-Benz failed, Mazda succeeded, managing to solve many of the rotary engine's idiosyncrasies, turning the engine into something genuinely viable for mass production to the mass market. While the RX-3 wasn't the first rotary powered Mazda, that honor goes to the absolutely gorgeous Cosmo sports car in 1967, the RX-3 sold more than 280,000 units globally, more than any other rotary vehicle before it, and in competition, went on to win the Fuji 500 on debut, and in doing so, put an end to the Nissan GTR's dominance in the Japanese Touring Car Championship. The RX-3 became known as a giant killer, outrunning cars with larger and notably more powerful engines across the globe. And remember, this was at a time when the cars racing were actually very close in spec, equipment and ability to what you could buy in the showroom. Even away from the track, thanks to the tuning scene, RX-3's pumping out north of 400 horsepower are a common sight within the rotary community. But where does this leave the RX-7? While the RX-3 was available as a wagon, a sedan, or a two-door coupe, the RX-7 was Mazda's first mass-produced outright sports car, and it drove the brand's success within the performance car genre to unprecedented heights. Debuting in 1978, the RX-7 has seen three definite generations. The small, light and low first gen FB coupe landed with a curb weight of just over a thousand kilos. And with the smooth, high revving compact engine situated behind the front axle, combined with a rear wheel drive layout with near perfect weight distribution, it provided incredible cornering ability. The second generation, or FC, was introduced in 1985. And in design terms, look, it clearly borrowed some inspiration from the Porsche 924. However, a load of performance enhancing improvements such as 
Volvo's Mazda's dynamic tracking suspension system and turbocharging were now fitted. Turbocharging turned out to be incredibly well suited to the rotary engines, and the now standard 1.3 litre 13B was offered in various states of tune with the most powerful perpetuating the giant killing reputation that the RX3 forged years earlier. Finally, the third and last generation FD RX7 arrived in 1992. And look, this thing is a serious performance car. A new sequential twin turbocharger increased the power substantially. And with arguably the best handling of all RX7s and that truly sublime styling, it pushed the RX7 into a whole other class of premium sports cars. Plus, as is well known, those power figures are easily increased with some intelligent tuning. In total, 811,634 RX-7s were produced between 1978 and 2002, making up the vast majority of all rotary-engined vehicles. These days, pricing in Australia kicks off from around about $30,000 for a first-gen Series 2 in pretty good condition. And it tops out at around about $180,000 for, say, a mint condition FD Spirit R. But it can be argued that even the iconic RX-7 does owe some of its success to our next car. It's the Datsun 240Z, or the 240Z. Both pronunciations are correct. I checked on Google. They're both correct. Don't yell at me. In 1967, Toyota released the absolutely gorgeous 2000 GT. It's something of a halo car for the entire Japanese auto industry. With a powerful, free revving, double overhead cam, straight six, and supercar worthy handling, it marked the arrival of the modern Japanese sports car. But there was a downside. It was thousands of dollars more than a comparable Jaguar E-Type. And without serious name recognition in the cutthroat sports car world, Remember, Toyota and Japanese cars in general were still regarded as being cheap and nasty at the time. The 2000 GT was a sales flop, but Nissan, or Datsun's US chief, Yataka Katayama, saw the potential of a 2000 GT type car for the American market. A halo car that could keep up with the world's best, but it had to stay affordable for most buyers. He pitched the concept to the head honchos in Yokohama, and in October of 1969, the result was unveiled. It was the 240Z, Japan's first true world-beating sports car. Like Ferraris, Jaguars, and Aston Martins of the time, it had cutting-edge features like disc brakes, fully independent suspension, and an overhead cam engine. But unlike those exotics, it cost around about the same price as a well-equipped V8 Mustang, yet it was faster everywhere than Ford's pony car. It even had a higher top speed than a Porsche 911 T of the time. Design-wise, the 240Z has commonly been called the Japanese Jaguar. And look, while the 240Z clearly borrowed some aesthetics from the E-Type, elements of the Porsche 911, Ferrari Daytona, and even some Maserati Ghibli were thrown in for good measure. Image-wise, the Z exuded cool right from the start, slotting into that sweet spot between European sports cars and Australian or American muscle cars. But unlike these more traditional alternatives, the 240Z's build quality and reliability set new standards. It was a pleasure to drive every day, and the cost of maintenance was no more than a normal car. Before the 240Z, like for performance cars, this was nearly unheard of. Today, the original Z ranks up there with the all-time greats, but it isn't just simply one of the greatest sports cars of all time. It established Japanese cars as not only just being good, but in many circumstances, better than anything else on the road. It's no exaggeration that every Japanese performance car owes a little something to the 240Z for the barriers that it broke through. And as the Japanese auto industry has used performance cars as their halo models to forge ahead globally, it can be argued that the original Z is one of the most important Japanese cars of all time, if not the most iconic. To get behind the wheel of one of these classics these days, you're gonna be looking anywhere from around about 60,000 to 150,000 Aussie dollars, with really, really special versions going for far north of that. And guys, that wraps up this series. What did you think of this list? What did you think of the entire series? Make sure you let us know in those comments below. And again, what have we missed? What cars make up your top five iconic but affordable cars list that we haven't included? Oh, and also, can you please hit those like, subscribe, and bell icon buttons, and also just you know share Redriven as much as you can, because the more you hit those buttons, and the more you share Redriven, the more of these videos we can make, and that's all we want to do. Keep making you guys the best car content that we possibly can. See you next time. From as a... Give me a bastard. Okay. One of the greatest, greatest. T -t Got to remember to breathe. Look, it's all equipment that we take for granted these days. F you, bus. Look, it's all equipment that we take for granted these days. Another fucking bus. But it was the S car. F Genuinely viable for the mass production.
fucking you piece of shit. Whole other class of you fucking piece of shit, Jeep. Nearly as bad as Harley's. This is a shit show today, mate. <laughs> Unbelievable.